Hey there YouTube, it's Pruitt and Jim Davis. And on today's Web DM, we're gonna teach you how to clean the ashes out of that wicker man, the poop out of your beard, and polish up that shillelagh. We're talking druids and role playing on Web DM. Let's traipse through the forest a little bit. Oh. The druids. The druids. Are we allowed to make that joke again? I is that, think is that this just... is like the third time we've oh, made that God. joke. Yeah. 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 Role playing <laughs> druids. Not everybody wants to be Radagast, you know. Sure. Not everybody just... wants to be Radagast. Although Radagast is a great inspiration for a druid, just like oh, the, the nature wizard, um, the beast wizard, the, what are they in Warhammer? The amber? I think they're either amber or jade. Something like one of the colors of magic in Warhammer. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're talking about Dungeons and Dragons today on WebDM. Not, uh, not Warhammer. Druids are one of those classes that they are easy to sort of stereotype those are like hippie tree huggers and, yeah. and, and animal lovers and, and things like that. And yet they're also sort of like nature wizards at the same time, like how they play kind of at the table. I really have a soft spot for druids. I played one in, for a while in second edition, played one for a long time in third edition. I like the concept of them. I mm -hmm. like the idea of of someone who's in touch with the natural world, of someone who's just in tune with the forces and the flow of everything, and like they can feel the elements seeping into the prime material plane. They're, yeah, yeah. they're an ambassador between the, the world of mortals and the, and the world of, of the, the fairies, and there's a weird relationship between civilization and the druid, like are they, uh, are they there to stop the encroachment of civilization on the natural world? Are they there to keep the peace between the two? Like there's a lot of different ways you can think about the druid beyond like, I hang out in a grove of oak trees and talk to my pet animals and eat mushrooms you know, all day. And eat mushrooms all day and that kind of thing. A druid is the class that's like they're in tune with this natural world and the natural forces of the world. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about th when dungeon masters are sort of setting up their campaigns and they know they've got a druid player, it's worth thinking about for a minute how you want the natural forces in your world to work. Do, right. do they follow physics? Do they follow real world forces of nature that yeah. we that we have to deal with? Uh, or is it magical? Is mm -hmm. it like it rains because a god or spirit or something of rain made it rain? Or is it just, is it raining because it's a natural consequence of the climate and weather yeah, and everything yeah. else? Yeah, enough moisture has, ev has evaporated up and they become saturated and that yeah. comes down. Yeah. And, and that's something worth thinking about and telling the druid player, it's like the natural world works like the natural world in ours as much as it can, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna have to make compromises, you're gonna have to, to cut corners someplace and, and, and hand wave some stuff. Yeah. Or do you go full on like this is a magical world and if you're watching some of the the the, the stuff paying attention to some of the stuff from the D, D creative team you know that they talk a lot about the background magic of dungeons and dragons not spells not magic items not whatever but just the fact that magic suffuses everything yeah. in D, D. and if you're going that route then it's like well what's to prevent you setting up a world in which there are no natural forces as we would understand them mm -hmm. and that river flows because a river spirit lives there yeah. that mountain exists because the mountain spirits that are there maintain the mountain and that applies to the sun and stars and the moon and if all of these things have a spirit and a magical force behind them, then that really kind of makes the druid, puts them in a special position if they're the ones that are the intercessors between that world, that magical world yeah. of nature and civilization. And I, I kind of like that <laughs> about well, the druid. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, at that point, they are just kind of like nature clerics, right? Right, Where right. They're, they're worshiping and caretaking the, these 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 spiritual uh, entities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as they were, and, and deri deriving power from them. There's the nature domain for the cleric, and obviously there's some overlap conceptually between nature domain and, and druids, just as there's overlap between how you play your druid and say certain types of wizards. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what type of druid you are and how you're playing your wizard, there could be significant thematic overlap. It's kind of one of those things where if you are thinking of playing where the natural world is has a divine uh, quality to it, because mm -hmm. of the spirits that inhabit it that keep the whole thing running, then you might want to look and see like, well, really, what is the difference between a nature cleric and a druid? Answer that question for, for a potential player. I kind of think that they're just two sides of the same coin and you really wouldn't make too much of a distinction between them. Mm -hmm. um, but it does start to lead me to, to sort of question like, what is the nature of druidic magic in general? 
Yeah. Right. Like, uh, is it divine? Is it divine? Right. And and I know that in in most, I think pretty much every edition, but fourth edition, in sort of the earlier editions of D and D, druids are kind of a subclass of cleric. Third edition, they are their own thing, um, but they're still sort of lumped in with the divine classes, and that just sort of like lets me think like if the druid's a divine class, then what is it exactly that they're drawing their divine power from? And that's what leads me to believe that there's spirits in the D&D world that the Druid uh, is invested in and they have in turn invested in the Druid. Yeah. But you could go the fourth edition round and say, no, this is a different power source than the Cleric. That The Druid draws upon the primal magic of the natural world. Mm -hmm. And maybe in that respect, you, you get rid of the spirits and other sort of intelligences, not even a word, Jim, good grief. Intelligence I. Intelligencies. Uh, it's a plural on <laughs> <yeah>. that? Whatever. <laughs> and you, whatever. You have just like the natural world that has magic in it. Yeah. And that has um, a magic force behind it. And the druid then learns to channel and harness that power through mm -hmm. primal magic. But there's not so much like beseeching spirits to perform some task on your behalf. Yeah. Um, which is how I would interpret spells being cast, is the spell is cast, you're beseeching a spirit to, to perform a task for you. Sounds to me that Jedi are just druids. When you hear about the background magic of Dungeons and Dragons, it, my, my first thought is like, Oh, it's like the force. Yeah, it, it's a, it suffuses everything. It suffuses it everything. Of, it bonds mm -hmm. everything together. Between you and me and the rock and the tree. And maybe a druid, that's how they see themselves. And mm -hmm. they and a lot of druidic training is just quiet meditation to sense the connections between the rock, the tree, me, and you, the this river. guy over here, the river, yeah. the tree over there, the tree across the planet, mm -hmm. the, the moon in the sky yeah. like those are the kinds of things that druids can start to sense and start to feel and maybe the difference between a druid and a nature cleric is that the nature cleric worships the god of the harvest the god of the forest but the druid is just like i cut that out i just worship the forest i don't even yeah. worship the forest i am tapped into its primal yeah. power we are the same we are the same and and the difference then between clerics and druids is that druids have sort of a faith-based magic that they use to you know, perform their miracles and the druid is just like no the natural world has its own magic and i'm in tune with it yeah i am the window or the door from which it escapes right i am the storm i can mm -hmm. summon it i can control it the druids are in nature there's always civilization around right right and then you have your your fey and other other aspects uh of the world and so the druid is kind of in the middle of all that right mm -hmm. as a role player like what where do you find yourself in that like are you the arbiter mm -hmm. between the two? Are you the protector of nature? Are you, you seek out justice on its behalf against right. the encroachment of civilization and progress? There's so, I mean, many, there's so many interesting things. And depending what the druid player picks, they're starting to create the world along with the dungeon master and giving the dungeon master points of conflict they can use later on. So if you adopt the attitude that the druid opposes civilization, and it seems like for a long time in Dungeons and Dragons, that's, that was the kind of MO. They yeah. don't use metal. They yeah. don't, uh, they, 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 they eschew that, even though metal is found in the earth, it's, you know. They, Just rework it. it. Yeah, it seems like a, an odd sort of thing to draw the line on, given the fact that they use scimitars and spears and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't use metal except for those other Except things. for those sickles and scimitars and, and whatnot. Those have symbolic meaning for the druid. Yeah. Right. But you can say like, all right, is the druid opposed to civilization? Are the, are the druids... The red and tooth and claw out in out in the wilderness where where life is nasty brutish and short like you don't leave the road <coughs> because there are druids out there mm -hmm. right and you won't know them because they all just look like a pack of wolves right right but those are people who fight against the encroachment the the trapping they they hunt down poachers and other trappers they hunt yeah. down loggers and people who would pollute the natural world they they oppose agriculture mm -hmm. and and in that sense they kind of become like eco primitive kind of uh, people. I think that's kind of an extreme end and it would be difficult to fit a character like that in a traditional D&D &D party. Mm -hmm. But you could still have one where they're skeptical of civilization. Yeah. Where they see civilization as making people soft, making them unfit to survive in the world. Their goal is really to be like, well, you need to, to, to leave the city. You need to return to the land. You need to return mm -hmm. to your roots. Um, and, and that can be sort of a way to, to, to play off against that. Could also say that the druids are there to keep the balance. 
between civilization and the natural world. They're there to negotiate with that town, like, hey, don't mind if you uh, take these trees here, right. but plant some new ones. Right. Rotate what you do and don't, don't just poach nature for all of its resources. Right, and so then the druid becomes someone who's there to lead communities in, in making sure that the place that they live isn't harmful uh, to, to the natural world. And you can kind of have this sort of, you, you draw, there's a whole, obviously in our own world, there's a whole body of literature and inspiration for like sustainable living and things like yeah. that. Well, what if your druid's just an advocate for that in yeah. a medievalish sort of setting? And they're the ones going around village to village teaching about say crop rotation and the importance of letting fields lie fallow to, to re recharge their nutrients. Right. Of, of saying like, well, this portion of the forest here is fit for uh, you know felling trees and, and harvesting the lumber there. But when you're done, we're also going to plant new trees there, maintains the balance between these two things so that there isn't as much conflict. Mm -hmm. So that there's not this sort of uh, war between the natural world with all the fey and the elementals and the intelligent beasts and everything else versus the civilized world. The druids keep the peace between those things. I kind of like that. That's sort of where I, I like them. I think that's how the Emerald Order is presented in Forgotten Realms is sort of maintaining that balance there. Yeah. But like you said, there's others, right? There's fairies that druids seem to be somewhat connected to because of the fairy's connection to the natural world. Right, right. That town next door pisses off a fairy right. and starts taking children. Right. So they gotta hire the druid and be like, hey, we don't know exactly what we did. Uh -huh. We did something. You gotta call a druid and the druid comes in and they reach out to the fae community and, and make the proper uh, atonements. And I like the druid as someone who navigates between these worlds and is constantly on the move. And it's just like, well, everyone knows in the winter the druid's in the city. But then in the springtime, the druid travels between the villages using the little byways and footpaths and hunting trails that exist there. Mm -hmm. And in between each one, he's also visiting the different fairy courts and, and powers, centers of power. Uh, and at the same time is making sure that the elemental spirits that inhabit the world are, are, are kept at peace, kept at rest. Right. And that they're not raging or, or you know, angered by something. Well, you know, you have a druid who who spends their time partially in the Feywild and partially in the Prime Material as an ambassador of the material world into the fairy, uh, fairy realm. Or you have a druids, you have druids who make annual pilgrimages to mm -hmm. the different, um, different inner planes of the elements to make sure that everything's fine. Is the water that's, gonna, that's flowing going to continue to be pure and drinkable? And that's like a world where you do have a, a world that's like animated by spirits of nature and yeah. things like that. Yeah, what happens if that water spirit just starts pissing downstream? It's gonna pollute everything. Or what happens when a group of people move in and start polluting that river and the spirit um, you know, takes revenge? and starts retaliating. Or just needs somebody, uh, you know, uh, there's an episode of uh, Avatar that's like that. Right. We have the factory that's polluting the river and uh -huh. the river spirit can't help out the village and it's dying. Yeah. And while Katara is not a druid, no. she certainly practices water magic. Right. Which could be kind of druid. I, 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 I mean, like, it's a good, at least a good example of like how a druid can interact and be the inner, the, um, the go-between between nature and the, and the, the people in your world. Right, and you could do worse than selecting uh, like a, a, you know, a druid to represent a, a bender from from uh, the last airbender, right? Like there's there's worse ways. Now, whether or not there's space in the in the D and D design world for some sort of monk druid combo, mm -hmm. you know, I know that there's the way of the four elements uh, for monk, but you know, you really like lean into it. And the druid, depending on spell selection, has a wide variety of elemental spells that they can call. Yeah, now I can't stop thinking about a druid monk wild shaped and doing all their monk things while in wild shape form right for anyway now it's a whole it's other, a whole other we'll save that uh for the monk show yeah <laughs> but oh my god you, you mentioned like what would it look like for them to, to be wild shaped into a a, a a crane practicing like crane style and that just sort of leads me in general to think about like what is wild shape we know mechanically what it is they get the players get to go shopping in the monster manual for a beast that they want to turn into mm -hmm. i really like the learning wild shape form rules from xanathar's guide i'm sorry but you should have to study something you can't just like get oh a brief description of, of what a whatever looks like right and yeah I'm gonna switch into that you're gonna right. look in like some kind of like mutant amalgamation maybe that works for wizards right like maybe wizards can read about an animal in a book 
and go visit one in a zoo somewhere and study it and look at it. But a druid needs to go into the natural world. I, this is going to sound weird and corny, but I don't know if you guys remember The Lion King when it first came out. And everybody was like, oh, all the animation and like all the Disney animators had to go to these zoos and watch the animals and spend yeah. time drawing them and spend time studying them. Yeah, how they move. How yeah. they move. And that's what I think that a druid has to do. That mm -hmm. a druid has to go and live amongst the animals has to be accepted by a pack of wolves, has to run and hunt with that pack of wolves, has to live with that pack of wolves, and then they can become a wolf. Yeah. A druid has to go hibernate with a bear. They have to go and they have to do to, through either animal friendship and food and just animal handling and whatever it is that the DM wants to work out how it looks, that's an adventure. Yeah. Right, like that. Is, learning your wild shape forms, going in, in the natural world and seeing what they look like. What does it look like when a cougar stalks its prey? What does it look like when uh, uh, when when an eagle swoops down from the sky to to pluck a rabbit out of a field? Right, right? and having to have to do that and have to spend that time there um, it, it is something that I think lends depth and complexity and 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 something that's different to a game where, that features a druid as opposed to just like oh well I well look at this I can finally wild shape into things that swim mm -hmm. it's like well what have you been doing in the meantime that gives you that ability how often have you been going in the water and just like letting fish swim around you and nibble on you how well how long have you been uh watching those otters yeah. as they play and swim in the river um those are the kinds of things that druids can do on their downtime, and, and then occasionally can be the centerpiece of a side quest or something like that. Oh yeah, if they want to learn something a little bit more exotic, you know, yeah, like I don't know, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are another one, right? Like, yeah. if dinosaurs are natural beasts, yeah. then they then they qualify for wild shape. Obviously, by the rules, they qualify for wild shape, yeah. right? No, I'm not going to let someone that lives up in the spine of the world suddenly turn into a dinosaur because they got wild shape. They're going to have to go find a dinosaur and study it. I'm going to need you to go ahead and head south to Chult. Right. But once they do, and once they study those dinosaurs, then it's like, yeah, of course dinosaurs are fair game. And number one, and, and to briefly discuss the rules for a minute, they are also the only beasts that have higher CR that are sort of worth a damn. And so unless you want to go to DM's Guild and, and pick up a rules expansion for higher level beasts, which if I was playing a druid, I certainly would, mm -hmm. uh, then you're kind of limited to, to dinosaurs for like, tier, you know, for CR 6, 7, and 8 uh, yeah. monsters. It's one of those things where I think it's perfectly within the DM's rights to say, yeah, you have to study the animals. You don't just gain infinite knowledge about all the animals mm -hmm. as soon as you can wild shape. Uh, you're going to have to sort of study them and look at them. But then it leads me to think of like what is turning into the beast, but is there are there other ways to sort of think about wild shape other than I turn into this animal? Mm -hmm. Like Maybe it's one of those things where it's like Game of Thrones, right? Where you possess an animal and that's sort of what the, the wild shape represents. Right. Could be inconvenient for the players to have to like find the animal and possess it and then their body is sort of vulnerable at the time but if a player came to me it was like yeah i kind of want to be a warg i don't necessarily want a wild shape i want to like take over an animal with my mind mm -hmm. um then we could there's a million different ways that you could work that out for the for the player definitely <laughs> want to climb a tree first make sure. sure make sure you're off the ground and safe you just get your half ogre to strap you on his back and yeah and you just <laughs> pass out <laughs> and you're flopping around yeah no i mean you're, you're in three half ogre what if it's like instead of a physical form it's a spiritual form and when the druid turns into a t-rex or a giant ape or whatever it is it looks more like uh what's the guy's name from teen titans animal boy or whatever it is, I forget what his name well, is. Well, I was gonna bring up Vixen from the CW show. Oh yeah, yeah, she's yeah. got that. The, she's got the amulet. The amulet, mm -hmm. and it's still her, but then like an anima banner of like a gorilla or yes. whatever. That's what I was and thinking as well. She possesses the strength and the mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. You know, first off, it's damn convenient because you're still a medium-sized creature, <laughs> but you have the stats of this animal that you're channeling. What it really just looks like is, yeah, our druid goes crazy and they don't actually grow claws but their regular fingers are as powerful as claws you Xanathar. mentioned xanathars right. they, they have some interesting tables for uh for the backgrounds on on little background info on druids let's, yeah let's go through that because i think that offers some interesting uh, role-playing possibilities the three tables that are there treasured item guiding aspect and mentor each of them kind of they, they do offer something and, they, and what i love about these tables for like all the classes is that these are things that are player oriented you're going to you're going to choose or roll on one of these tables or use them to inspire you for something that's not in one of the six entries and then like now you've given the dungeon
dungeon master something to play with. You've introduced an element of your class or your, your background that's like, oh, the dungeon master can take advantage of this. The more information you're giving them, the more gameable information you're giving them. Well, I mean, that's is what the we're key. Looking for. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you can write a, a 100 page backstory. But if you don't like offer any context, if it's just a list of things you did, it's like yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. I heard of you. Yeah, we've heard of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're a folk hero, right? When I say gameable ideas, gameable information, gameable points, we're looking for things that the dungeon master can turn into NPCs that they can use that are related to your background. They're looking for ways to build encounters off of what you've included, or to find ways to poke at and antagonize your player in ways that will help them grow and help them. Uh, overcome challenges and adversity. So like the treasured item is sort of a, a keepsake with spiritual significance. Yeah. What if that's stolen? What if, I mean, that's a great fodder for like a low level uh, adventure. Like, oh yeah, my druid's keepsake was stolen by imps or yeah. brownies or whatever, gremlins. And right, now right. we've got to go get it back. Um, and if, particularly if it's like something that the druid is normally connected with, maybe it's an enemy trying to provoke a fight with the druid, and they're saying like, well, we're gonna frame the fairies for uh, for stealing this druid's keepsake, um, but it's actually, you know, another entity trying to spark beef with uh, between the druids and the fairies. Or something right, like throw, that. Throw, throw nature out of balance in that area. Throw nature out of balance in that area through, through minor misunderstandings and things like that. Guiding aspect is sort of a, a nature spirit that the druid embodies. This is an area for you to take your druid and go like, well, what part of the natural world do I want this druid to be to symbolize? Do mm -hmm. I want the raw power of a storm and and just the the lashing rain and the lightning and the wind or is it or is my druid an ocean druid and it's yeah. just like sometimes calm and serene and beautiful and at other times terrible and and mighty in their power. Uh, do they embody of wild animals or something? That's what like shepherd druids great for. They're more like animal focused druids. It's like what sort of animal does your does your druid most embody? That's yeah. what you can sort of learn from your guiding aspect. And then finally with the the mentor, this is the one I like the most because it offers a possibility of introducing like magical and monstrous creatures for your druid to have learned things from. Right? Mm -hmm. Like what if in order to learn all of this water magic, a druid has to study with a water elemental of some kind to spend time with the water weirds and the, and the nerids and all the other stuff that, uh, that, that commands and controls water in order to understand like, ah, yes, this is how I do it. Obviously taking inspiration from Last Airbender with that, yeah. You gotta learn from the badger moles. <laughs> you gotta learn from the badger moles and the dragons, and then the DM can create those things within their world. They can say, yeah, here are the ways in which a druid reaches out to creatures in the natural world and learns from them and learns how to command the magic that, that, that comes to them naturally. And it also creates points of conflict because someone might go, oh, Wait a second, your mentor was this thing? What? <laughs> this thing that's destroyed our village for the last three seasons? Right, you know, that your thing was a, a living bonfire that travels across the land in a giant tornado of fire and ash and, and whatever. It's like, well, yeah, how else am I gonna learn how to cast flame blade and... It burns all of our fields. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you need to do that every you now and then. You need to do that every now and then. <laughs> that's how you keep it, you gotta <laughs> rotate the nutrients. And thus, the druid comes in and gets rid of a misunderstanding between nature and man. Absolutely, absolutely. What's some different ways to play it uh, kind of off type if you want to do a, a little bit different of a role playing experience? One of the things that I, I see crop up a lot and that we had in, in Saber Dice season one is the urban druid. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot. Uh, it, it seems to be a fairly popular kind of uh, take on the druid is a druid who doesn't see an urban environment as unnatural. Right. But instead recognizes the ecology and the natural world that is a part of an urban environment. And particularly when we're talking like medievalish cities, first of all, they're not nearly as big as we might think they are. They're fairly small in both terms of population and, and actual area. Because they're still so closely tied with the natural world, they're tied with farming communities that, mm -hmm. that are sort of in their hinterland that provide them food. They're not these sort of sterile urban environments like we might imagine, they're ones where the natural world is very much still a part 
of of the urban experience in a lot of Dungeons and Dragons worlds. Oh yes, I mean, as a as a great man once said, life finds a way, right? Life will find a way. Not to mention the fact that there are those dark corners of the urban environment where the natural world still holds sway. There's that abandoned house covered in kudzu vines that that's slowly crumbling. There's the pockets of ooze and and slimes and things underneath the wizard's quarter mm -hmm. that need to be tended to so that they don't become possessed by the spirit of Dweeblix and, and become a problem. All the cast off from their experiments and right. the druid has to come along and clean it up. Shake his fist up at the wizards yeah, down in the sewer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a druid uh, is engaged in a, a magical breeding program to create uh, the, uh, a horse. Some kind of horse that's that's perfectly designed for for war or farming or or transport, and they're using magical means to sort of facilitate this. The druid's there to just make sure that no one gets hurt, uh, and that the process itself isn't too um, you know isn't too onerous on the animals. Oh man! Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about playing the druid that first created the centaur. Mm, he's a madman like, druid. A madman druid either, either it was on purpose or it was after a long night of drinking. Mm -hmm. And he woke up and was like, well, shit. But the, like, cr 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 thinking, building off of that, right? Like, what if you did have a, an order of druids who was a, opposed to civilization and, and, and wanted to g get back at them? Then why wouldn't they create a bunch of, like, monstrosities inspired by the natural world to sin against Mm -hmm. uh, the against their enemies. I had a guy do that in one of my uh, short campaigns. It was his whole part purpose. It was <laughs> right. just a savage druid that was pissed off about them yeah. taking all of his forests away. Awakening a bunch of forest animals and, uh -huh. and organizing them into an army. Uh, yeah, can you imagine what a bunch of forest animals that possessed human intelligence would do? It'd be terrifying. Uh, yeah, if there was a lot of them. <laughs> if there was a lot of them. Yeah, it'd be bad. It'd be bad times for everybody. <laughs> Uh, so I, th I think that, um, I mean, that's what, obviously the sort of like, uh, the, the newest Unearthed Arcana had uh, the spore, the Circle of Spores Druid, and that's yeah. kind of a, a necromancy focused uh, uh, Druid. I've been looking for something like this for a long time, so I found it very fortuitous and curious. Yes, that it curiouser <laughs> curious and curiouser. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> but I, I really like the Druid there. I know uh, some people are complaining about the poison damage and how... Uh, poison damage easily resisted, but I find it thematically very interesting. A druid that doesn't see undeath as unnatural, but is just kind of like there's life, death, and then there's undeath. And the, the, the bodies of the dead are still both useful, and there's as long as they're not trying to turn everything else into an undead wasteland, yeah. there's nothing necessarily wrong with a little unlife as long as it's for a greater purpose. Right, well, all things in moderation, right? All things in moderation, of course. I like the idea of a druid that goes around and, like, say, finds the corpse of an an a half-eaten corpse of an animal in the woods, and it's just like, well, I can make use of this. This is not yet, we're not done with this yet. And animates this sort of, like, creature that's been, ha like I said, half-eaten and gore-covered and everything, and now they're walking around with a, a, a pack of zombified animals. You guys are going to have to let Animate Dead do something more than just humanoids. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see who's listening. Then those are kind of sort of the off-brand uh, kind of druids that I can think of. The, the big one that I always want to try is just the nature wizard, playing them like a wizard with a different spell list and a different ability type. Yeah, but they, they go out in nature like with the purpose to learn and they, they categorize all the trees uh -huh, and they uh -huh. learn how to interact with it just by just sheer study and curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that idea. I'd, I'd probably take something like Ritual Caster uh, to, to reinforce that thematic uh, component to it so that they have both the wizard rituals but the druid, um, mm -hmm. the druid spell slots and spell lists. And so like those are the kinds of things that I think, like there's so many different ways to uh, c consider your druid, yeah. what they do, what their relationship is with the world around them that I think just thinking about those things will begin to produce druids that move beyond the tree-hugging hippie types. That, that I think it's easy to, 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 to start there, but we don't want to finish there. We want right. to expand our ideas sort of beyond that. It's they smoke high. pipe. They smoke pipe weed, which I don't think Tolkien meant to, as marijuana. I think no, it's I tobacco. Think I think everybody else took it and ran with it because it was the '70s and it sort of stuck. Well, and they say pipe weed. They say and pipe the weed. The fact yeah. that you say weed yeah. means something different back then. Yeah. 
Yes, it's pipe weed. Um, it's tobacco. It's the it's a, bo- a long barrel bottom from Old Farthing. <laughs> long bottom leaf. Long bottom leaf. The whole scene in The Hobbit is that they all, all the dwarves and Gandalf sit around the fireplace blowing smoke rings at each other. Right. And Gandalf can make his look like different shapes with pressed yeah, digitation. See, I just, I just kind of see it more as like a hookah thing where mm-hmm. it's a little bit more than tobacco but not quite marijuana. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But So there is a bit of an effect. Sure. Sure. And there's a reason why people sit around and do it in groups as opposed oh, to just, sure. you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know. But you know they're no, not there just getting no, fucked up. He, he, now he will thunderbuck. He likes to get high. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. Your thunderbuck's gonna have to see beyond. He's got to see beyond. You he expands alt- his consciousness in any ways he can. <laughs> yep. 